Right, I think we have a full house. So uh, welcome everybody to this session on women in data and technology. My name is David Reed. I am the editor-in-chief at Data IQ. And before you, we have an absolutely fantastic lineup to dig into this uh, very important and significant issue. So starting from your left, we have Pyle Jane, who is the chair of Women in Data UK. Next to her, we have Jennifer Holt, who is head of pricing and analytics at Hastings Insurance Services. Then we have Celia Wilson, who is consumer data consultant for Condé Nast. And next to me, we have the legend Edwina Dunn, who is chair of the female lead, which we'll be hearing a lot more about very shortly. So why am I sat here chairing a session on women in data? Well, my job is obviously to mansplain the answers that we get. No, um, it's actually because, first of all, at DataIQ, we take the issue of diversity very, very seriously. If you go onto our site and type in the terms diversity or women in data, you will find a lot of content relating to the importance uh, in terms of recruitment and the impact on this sector of ensuring that you have a diverse workforce. And also within our power list, the Data IQ 100, um, I exert myself as, as uh, much as I can to ensure uh, female representation in that list, which is not easy when you think we're, we're looking at the C-suite. Um, in this year's 100, we have 28 women, which is okay, but not good enough. Um, so please do go to our website and nominate those female leaders in this industry so that we have a fantastic long list to choose from. So to kick us off, um, the, this session is called Women in Data and Technology. And those two terms have been put together as if perhaps they are the same, but I wonder if that is the case. And, Edwina, as someone who has worked very closely in this industry now for, for a, a couple of years since you left school <laughs> yeah. in the early 2000s, Indeed. Um, what's your view on that? Should we address this as one thing or as two separate things? Well, um, you know, in my view, um, they are very different, but they go hand in hand. I mean... You know, exploring data, which is my absolute passion and has been my career and livelihood um, for many, many years now. Um, you know, I see the X factor, the X ingredient as being data because um, as we all know, and as my partner in crime, Clive Humby coined, data is the new oil. And why is it the new oil? Because it needs refining, it needs processing in order to generate something of great value. And I think the other thing um, that we need to do with the raw product of data is not just find it interesting, but actually turn it into action. So for me, that's why we need technology because as we all know, data's got bigger and bigger and it's impossible for the human brain to process it fast enough. Um, you know, when I started, computing was the limitation on how big the data. And so when we were trying to manage club card, um, you know, the physical boundaries of computers meant that to manage club card would actually cost 50 million pounds, which was just an impossible ask at that time. So things have moved on. We can now hold massive data in even our mobile apps, but processing it means we need technology. So the two, I think, go hand in hand. But for me, the beauty of technology is that we now have compelling reasons for it and we know how to use it, or we mostly know how to use it. But in itself, it isn't really an end result, it's an enabler. But we know that the technology industry struggles with diversity, especially attracting female candidates. Because the data sector is newer, do we have the opportunity to avoid some of those challenges and to get a much more balanced and representative workforce as a result? So, I mean, the thing I'm most proud of, the business 
that I co-founded with Clive Humby was Dun Humby, and we grew from the two of us to 1,500 people across 30 countries. Um, the, the thing that stands out for me is, you know, that is a tech business. Data is a new industry. The data sciences is one of the sexiest, most brilliant, highly sought after, headhunted like mad industries. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Rashin. And, um, and, and so it's hugely exciting. But Dunhumby was 50% female. Right, so all these people that say tech isn't women friendly, it's rubbish, isn't it? I mean, I think women are brilliant at maths, they're brilliant at physics, and they're brilliant at technology. What they don't like is dead end jobs and geeky language, right? Yeah. So Celia, on that same question, um, do you see yourself as a data person or as a technologist, or are the two unified in the way that Edwina um, just described? So, I mean, I've always seen myself... Oh, is this working? I've always seen myself as more of a data person, and I've come up the data route, and I think, historically, for the last kind of 20 years or so, they have been quite different in the challenges that they faced. Um, data, and all the teams I've worked in, the teams I work in at the moment, have been... 50% female or even more and I think that's partly because you can come from a range of backgrounds you can have a range of degrees it doesn't necessarily have to be hard science technology on the other hand I think has been more challenging for women to get into you have to have had a more scientific degree and possibly to a higher level and the sad fact is that there are fewer women doing you know, a PhD in computer science and there are men. An even sadder fact is that that percentage has actually been declining since the 80s and 90s. One of the reasons given for that is the rise of the home computer. Home computers, when they first started, it was all about games and they were very heavily marketed and targeted towards boys and they created a sort of gamer culture which then was carried through into technology companies, which is quite sort of um, intimidating to women. And again, women might be doing these degrees, and then they see these companies, and they see that's a, an environment where I don't necessarily want to work. And there are great companies like Dunhumby, which are welcoming to women and, you know, from lots of people from different backgrounds. Um, but some of the new bigger tech companies, I was talking to someone in, um, I won't name the company, but let's say one of the new big up-and-coming up gig economy companies. And I also won't use the language that he used to describe that environment because it's not really appropriate for here. But let's say he said there's a lot of male posturing going on and a lot of kind of um, my data model is bigger than your data model. And it's not necessarily A, what's best for the business and B, very accessible to women, and that is a problem for getting women into the tech industry. But with big data, the two industries are converging because for big data you need technology, which could be a problem for women who don't have these degrees. But also, I see it as a positive. In a way, it's a kind of, it's a stealth way to get women into technology if they come up through the data route. So in the working environments that you have been in, Celia, um, Guardian and I think currently Condé Nast. Uh, what about the the uh, gender divide that you've seen? Having heard that Dunhumby managed to hit 50/50. Sure. So I'm in, uh, well. I'm a consultant for the uh, data and insight team at Condé Nast at the moment. Uh, and I don't know if everyone knows Condé Nast, but they're a magazine publisher and they publish Vogue and Vanity Fair. As you can imagine, it's quite a female environment. And in the data team, I think it's a team of 15. There are 11 women. So <laughs> I talked to them yesterday about the challenges they felt in a male-dominated industry, and they're just looking at me like, what? <laughs> I, d I don't get it. But they did all say, it's difficult. When I go to a tech meetup or a tech panel, it's all men. And why, are, why are there no women there? Interesting. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, um, for you, data, technology, both together, or an impossible divide between the two? I very much see myself. Hello. I see myself more as a, as a business person, and I use data to be commercially minded. Um, I, um, I, you know, I'm very envious of the uh, the diversity that you have in, in your team. Um, I think I think perhaps um, data lends itself a little better towards um, uh, uh, the some of the female qualities. Um, because you're much more at the coal face with the business. Um, 
and, um, and I, I think that, that women's intuition and women's personalities can really sort of flourish um, in, a, in a data world. Uh, but I struggle, I struggle. I have three people in a team of 34 that are women and I'd love to have more. That's interesting because uh, the perception would be certainly that in the insurance that that is a very male dominated industry regardless of what level of technology or data is being used. Is that a factor perhaps in, in the recruitment challenge? I'm not sure really because um, I think Hastings is very different in how they do insurance compared with other insurance companies. Um, we put much more focus on the digital side and uh, price optimization and trying to be at the top of the uh, price comparison sites. And we use a lot more modern techniques around machine learning um, and it's less traditional insurance. So uh, most of my colleagues um, we all come from non-insurance backgrounds, so I'm not sure necessarily it's driven by the insurance industry. Um, but um, again, we, I agree with Edwina, we do the sexy stuff um, and, um, and I, I, I'd I'm perplexed. I'd love to know why we don't have more female candidates. Especially as the, uh, the pioneer, the inventor almost of programming was a woman, Countess Ada Lovelace. Let's not forget, um, not sure if it's in your book, we'll come to that. She's not alive, so she wouldn't be. Um, Payal, I've, uh, I've seen you describe your, your career track and, and you've you moved across quite a lot of functions. So do you perceive yourself as being in data, technology, business, something else? How do you describe yourself? Um, so I, I think um, Jennifer's right. It's all around uh, solving problems and data and technology are the enablers to do that. And it's incredible the types of problems that you can solve with data and technology. And you can actually solve some of the world's biggest problems through it. So I think that's the incredible thing that is really similar across the two. I think there are differences, of course. Um, you know, thinking about data, it's looking for what's important here and what's been important in my career is looking for the insights. So data on itself is just information, but the insight is how you then monetize that and actually how you then make a difference and an impact. And I think that's how I've lived through my career. And so whether I've been in analytical roles or commercial roles, it's around what are you doing with that information that makes a difference to the business and their customers. So, Pyle, we heard from Jennifer about uh, a recruitment challenge, but also a positive view uh, at this end of the panel. I think you have something that, that might help to inspire um, and draw more women into this industry. Um, perhaps you'd like to introduce that. Sure. So, um, you know, what we've seen over the years, you know, working in, in data and technology is that there are a lack of women in some of the, these roles. And we need more women to go into senior roles and really make a difference for businesses. And the thing that we find really important is shining a light on female talent. So I'm really proud to share the collaboration between women in data and the female lead. And here's a short video that describes what we're doing. The data industry is perceived as being super geeky and um, not very creative and very, very driven by men um, because they're good at numbers, apparently. Well, those things aren't true. Well, this collaboration between the female lead and women in data is really all about shining a light on the fabulous roles that women can play in business and in society. We have a great range of women uh, that we're showcasing in the 20 in data. That's anybody from the youngest CDO through to somebody that's heavily involved in machine learning and data science for the Amazon Alexa, through to somebody that successfully ran a global analytics academy and really given back to the industry. It's so exciting and refreshing to look at celebrating um, achievements of women in the data industry at all levels of senior so not only at the C-suite, we're looking at people throughout the career journey. It's saying, you know, you can do this and you can show organisations and your male counterparts just how much we can offer um, back to the problems that we're facing in our work lives because it's proven that diverse teams have a broader impact on the business. And that women will want to follow in the footsteps of other trendsetters in this industry because frankly, we all know you can't be what you can't see. These women are um, show-stopping. 
They truly are, and we can't wait to showcase them. Coming soon, just how soon? When, when can people find out more? Oh, am I? Yeah. So we have our Women in Data conference um, in two weeks' time. So it's two weeks today on the 30th of November. And that's when we um, acknowledge and, um, you know, announce uh, our 20 incredible women at that event. And so you'll be able to look on the uh, Women in Data and the Female Lead websites and um, find out who they are, hear about their incredible stories and how they've got to where they've got to and what's made them the people they are. So really excited about that. Pyle, one more, more question for you. Um, it struck me that you have 20 fantastic British exemplars to talk about. Do you think we have an opportunity in this country, in this marketplace, to avoid some of the downsides we might have seen in other markets where there's been a, a different, more male-dominated culture? You know, it's, it's a great point, David. Um, you know, obviously, there's been a lot of press in terms of what's been happening. But um, there's also a lot of great, great stories. Um, you know, if I look at Scandinavia, a lot of their top tables are 50-50, men and women. And I think as much as, um, you know, we've got some of these negative things happening around the world, we need to make sure that we take care of the UK economy and think about the businesses that we interact with, fix it. And, you know, I know all of us are super keen to go global and to spread our excitement and passion about this topic. So that's how I'd like to look at it. Okay. Um, Edwina, in that video, uh, we heard reference to the business impacts of diversity. So can you help us to understand uh, why it makes sense for the board, the C-suite downwards, to be keeping a very close eye on recruitment and trying to ensure they do have that diversity? Well, I think the thing that I can sort of draw out as the best example is I, I mentioned I work with uh, retailers around the world. I work with consumer product goods companies around the world, some of the biggest businesses in the world, you know, Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, General Foods. These businesses um, have audiences, have customer bases that are largely female. I mean, let's not forget that. You know, the, the female consumer is a massively powerful force and a massively powerful voice. Um, I used to analyze, and, and still today, I'm analyzing, you know, multi-millions of consumers every day. If they are women, mostly, then why do we not have leaders who can empathize and, and who can relate to the fact that they are largely or often the shopper in the household. And so there's a very practical point of view, which is women are very defining consumers, even in the car sector. You know, I think the latest um, wisdom is that women are, you know, a massive force in the decision making. They're the ones who tend to go on the comparison websites and decide what the budget can withstand. So um, even from that point of view, it's compelling. I think for the second reason, that diversity uh, gives better decision making. Um, we were all laughing just ahead of this session about what it feels like to be in a boardroom dominated by men. And it's sort of where, I don't know whether any of you relate to this, but it's where you make your point and you think, wow, I've just landed the most important event of this session. And you find out there's a deafening kind of silence. And then a few minutes later, a man makes exactly the same point and everybody goes, that's so good. That's exactly right. And there is something about this. I mean, you learn to have a laugh about it. You learn not to resent it. But, you know, we have to find our voice. We have to find our way of communicating our points and actually getting them across. Because I don't think men do it on purpose. It's just what they hear and what we all tend to do is recruit in our image. Mm. And so we get a bit deaf to other voices and we don't necessarily recruit 
in a way that's different. That's interesting. Celia, I, I've seen you speak on the subject of how to communicate to the business um, some, some of the outputs from this data activity. Um, are there techniques that you have found work and allow you to land that point uh, and get, therefore, the credit for something as a result? Sure. And um, just want to say that that is so common that um, making a point uh, and then having a man repeat the point that it's actually got a name, which is being heat-peated, which I think is brilliant. I, I heard that the other day and I was like, oh, yeah, that happens to me all the time. Um, I, th I think... I think it is harder for women to speak up, and I've, you know, I've, I've talked about this with the people in my team, and I've talked about this with a lot of women, and I think women are much, much more likely to suffer from imposter syndrome, which is the, the feeling that you're, and I see a lot of people nodding, which is the feeling that I don't really know what I'm talking about. Even when you actually do know what you're talking about, you kind of there's a voice in your head going, I, I don't know what I'm talking about, and I'm sort of blagging it, and any minute now, I'm going to get found out. And you think it's just you, but actually, almost all women feel like that at some point. I'm not saying men don't. Men feel like it occasionally, <laughs> statistics show, but women feel like it all the time. So partly, you have to have sort of have a word with yourself and say... <laughs> Okay, um, everyone feels like that. So, you know, even if I'm just blagging it, maybe everyone feels like they're blagging it, so maybe I should just say it. Um, but also, I think uh, it's, about, it's about being a role model for, for women in your team. Um, and I think something that women are very, very good at is self-deprecating. And this is the thing I find hard. When I'm being a role model for women in my team, as well as other women, my daughters even, uh, is actually just bigging myself up occasionally and saying, do you know what, I did this thing and I was proud of it. And the more we do that, as well as obviously bigging other women up, the more it will become acceptable and we won't have this kind of culture where women always have to be modest, both to themselves and outwardly. Yes, it's interesting. You have to tell people how good you are, and more than once, I, I, I suspect. Um, Jennifer, uh, in terms of recruitment and ensuring diversity, and you mentioned you know, having three out of 30 women in the team. Uh, Edwina mentioned how that might impact on decision making um, and uh, bias within decisions. Do you do anything to try and adjust for that when you're doing the, the, the analytics, you're, you're, you're looking at the outputs and thinking, hmm, have we made that assumption because of the profile of the team as much as from what the data is telling us? I think, um, I think I'm very, very fortunate that I have um, diversity in the team in other ways. Um, so I have a very international team um, and they bring lots of different challenges and different ideas. Um, and I am very fortunate that the, uh, the women that we do have in the team are incredibly good at their job and, um, and we nurture them to be outspoken. I was only in a, a development conversation with one of my colleagues um, this week and just encouraging her to um, be less subservient and uh, to share her ideas. So we do have a very good culture that we foster to, to bring um, the ideas to the forefront. Um, but it's, um, yeah, th I, I think I do still suffer from, from a balance of a lack of women. Um, but we do what we can to try and bring the best out in the women that we've got. So do you have a perception of what the difference would be if you had, say, a 50-50 gender balance in the team? Look, I, I don't think that this, for me, is not... Diversity is not just about uh, women and men. It's about filling your, filling your um, team with lots of diversity in different, in different ways. Um, like Edwina said, I, I work for an insurance company. We all drive cars. I want to make sure that you know I'm representing the customer base. Um, so it's not just a, a, a women and men thing. It's about bringing diversity in from all different backgrounds. Okay, um, Pyle, uh, on the recruitment point, I think it was you who told me this. If it wasn't, I apologise for landing this one on you. But the way that jobs are described in ads, I think, can have an impact on the sort of candidates who put themselves forward. Uh, can you give us um, 
any views on how you can adjust the recruitment process to try and get the right outcome without looking at Rasheen and uh, <laughs> having her speak into your ear? No, exactly. Well, you know, I, I've managed big teams and, um, you know, I guess given I was a woman at the top of that team and we've managed to attract a lot of female um, females into it. And I think one of them is having role models within the team. So that actually, you know, you'd be surprised at how that starts to solve some of the diversity problem um, and the challenge because people are attracted to some of those elements. You know, I've been in uh, boardrooms where, you know, there's 50 men and then there's me. You know, that's quite intimidating, even for a confident person. So it's really important that you do have um, role models and a diverse panel to actually interview the candidates and attract them to your organization. So it does go all the way through the value chain of you know, the job description, how you interview, what types of questions you're asking. You know, I think it's a common story that you hear that a woman will tell you why you can't do the job, whereas a guy will tell you why they can. And again, it's having awareness of that. So as you're interviewing you know, this talented group, you're actually aware of some of the pitfalls and then you can explore with your questioning to really extract out and understand their true talent of who you're talking to is, is hugely important. Absolutely. Um, well, you are all uh, women in this industry, um, thriving, um, successful. Uh, are there any things that have worked for you to overcome some of those, let's call them cultural hurdles, um, are there emerging things that might help some of the people in the audience and the candidates who are keen to get on in this industry to push themselves forwards and, and get to the, the level that uh, some of you have achieved? Um, Edwina, you're, you're very well established, but I know you're extremely focused now on encouraging yeah. the next generation. What do you tell them? Well, I think the first thing, um, which was brilliant advice, is you have to stand and be counted. Uh, you know, most of the women I talk to, you know, if you say you're a role model, will go, no, 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 not me. You mean somebody else. And I would encourage all of you to accept that you are probably a role model for others. And, and one of the things that I'm doing is actually creating um, a whole... Um, set of inspirational uh, materials, not necessarily for, for, for your age groups, but for young girls at school. So these, um, this book, these films of 60 amazing women, including Meryl Streep, Christine Lagarde, Christiane Amanpour, they're going to 9,000 schools and universities in the UK. We've already got them out to 2,000 schools. Um, they're also going to 9,000 schools in the US. And the idea behind it is that we encourage girls and boys to understand living female role models. So Ada Lovelace, absolutely brilliant, but she's dead. Um, and, you know, most boys we know are um, able to quote their sporting heroes and probably their champion gamers like PewDiePie and they trip off their tongue quite easily. But for girls, they will still quote my mother or my grandmother, right? There's nothing wrong with that. You know, my mum was my inspiration too. But these women are about saying there are 60 different ways you can have the most brilliant, fulfilled life by following your passions. So you can, one, nominate a school for free to get this pack. So you can nominate your old school or where your children are going now and they get this free pack. Or you're feeling very generous you can buy one Christmas is coming and you can inspire someone in your family or whatever and the stand is literally just out there so please do stop by thank you they take card or cash apparently <laughs> um, we have timed out uh, so please join me in thanking the panel Edwina Celia Jennifer and Pyle thank you thank you and thank you for joining us and go and succeed. <laughs>